Tallied on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tallied on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Go tallied on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain. This is where we're going to be t- spending a lot of our time for the next several weeks. Can you believe it's Christmas? Oh my gosh, but I love it. I really do. I love it until I have to leave my house and I don't love it anymore. I just, I just want a fireplace and, and I just want... Uh, the meat eater on, on Netflix. That's all I want, and 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 I, I want to be. I want to bake bread, and but we don't always get what we want, do we? Yeah. Hey, listen. For the for the next several weeks, we're going to be in this series called "Go Tell on the Mountain." It it's an amazing song. It is an old African American uh, a spiritual. Uh, the slaves would sing this song over and over, and it is a declaration of praising God and worshiping him for the greatest gift that the world has ever received. It was a really unknown song. It was virtually unknown. The world didn't know about it, except from plantation to plantation, they would share it only by word of mouth, never written on pieces of paper, but only word of mouth would be shared. And it would be sung from plantation to plantation. It was John Wesley Works who began to compile all of these songs that had never been documented and on his second book that he put out in, in, in being able to document these African-American spirituals that this song just captured the heart of America. Uh, there was a band, the Mamas and the Papas. Who remembers the Mamas and the Papas? You heathens. Oh, my gosh. No, no, that's good music. The Mamas and Papas, you remember when they came out and sang it and all the world seemed to hear it for the first time. And we all began to sing it after that. It's funny how the Mamas and the Papas rescued it and it was the church that took it from there. That's funny right there. I don't care who you are. Yeah. But, but it's, it's just this amazing testimony to go and shout it. Share it with everyone you know. Go tell it on the mountain. But today, I want to start in a very unusual place. Maybe in your mind, you already have figured out where we're going to go with this and how we're going to do, and the shepherds and and the angels, and we're not. We're going to start at really the very beginning. And for that to happen, I need you, both on our online campus and in this room today, to just be willing to go way back, to start at the very reason why we should celebrate the good news of our Savior. But to do that, we all need to be in one accord. We all need to invite the Holy Spirit to show us what it is in this word we listen to and read today. Why is it so important for us to know? So on our online campus and you joining us here today, would you bow your heads and let's pray? Father God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. You are great, you're greatly to be praised But let us really look at why should you be praised? Where did this come from? How did it begin? And today, Father, I pray that with humble beginnings, I pray that our worship would arise from what we're about to study and look at today. Father, open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. And Jesus, anoint me. I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would fill me to speak your word Father, we trust you, we thank you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. When you think of the word enemy, what do you think of? Enemy. Enemy. Someone in opposition to you. Someone complete in the opposite faith and belief of you. Different convictions, different truths. An enemy that has set itself up to attack you, to be completely against everything you are. These are the things that I think of. But in, for us to understand why we should go tell it on the mountain, I would like to deposit something in your heart that maybe you never knew or something that we need to remember just so that we can see why this season is so important to celebrate the birth of our Savior. The reality is, anytime you look at Scripture, you're going to find that we are an enemy of God. And I know this may shock you. 
Your entire nature, my entire nature, is fleshly. And it fights God's kingdom with everything in it. Even this day as a pastor, you would think, Ty, I bet you got it going on. Listen, buddy, i got to start off just in repentance, just to get to the point where I can start pastoring from there. You know what we got in common? We're both sinners. Saved by grace, hopefully. But for us to understand how we should shout it on the mountain, how we should give God praise and glory, I want to start this series off in the most unusual way maybe to you. Because it should be a time of handbells and choirs and trumpets. And, 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 but I would like to be very pastoral and lead us back in order to move us forward. We are enemies of God. Everything about us fights him. The beginning of us before we even got here starts and takes place in a perfect scenario. A Garden of Eden in which two humans, Adam and Eve, sinned against God their creator. Did the one thing that God told them not to do and gave them permission to do everything they wanted to do except for this one thing. But just because of the sinful nature inside of them, because they were deceived, and that's very important, because they were deceived, they were led as enemies of God by an enemy of God. Satan himself convinced us that we could do better than God could do. And this is a very important reason that we start off like this. In fact, I want to back it up with Scripture. I don't just want to throw this out there. It's very important. Look at some of the Scriptures. Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Stop. First, you begin to see that there's always a pointing in the New Testament towards the greatness of Jesus and everything that he did. And if you're like me, you pay attention to these things. And so I want to first see that we are going to celebrate what Jesus has done by looking at these New Testament scriptures. But there's some hidden nuggets in it that we have to get an understanding of. And in this, we see that the Father is pleased that in him, this is Jesus, all the fullness should dwell, which means that Jesus took care of it all. It continues, and it says this, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, which means only way to God is through Jesus, and all things are reconciled, reconciled to God through Jesus. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And then it says this last and final thing, a nugget we need to pay, pay attention to, and it says, and you, everybody say, that's me, that's me. and you. And me, he's speaking directly to us in this moment right now. As a celebration of where we once were, he says, you were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now he has reconciled. That's not the only mention of being an enemy of God. Let me show you in Romans. In Romans chapter 5 verse 10 it says, For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So incredible, this story of what Jesus did. But the only way you're ever going to appreciate it, if you understand who you are without Jesus. Come on, you got you to, the only way you're ever going to celebrate it is if you recognize who you are without Jesus. The only reason that those that celebrate him are the ones that know the value of what he did for them when they didn't deserve it. It's kind of like if you ever get a gift but don't know the cost. It's kind of like if you ever just assume you're going to get the gift, but you don't care about the cost, you just want it to be done for you. And you're a selfish child, a selfish child who just says, well, I deserve it. And none of us like selfish kids do us. Do we? Do us. <laughs> Do we? And the reason that I bring this up is because if you're ever going to really shout from the rooftops tops the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and you're going to tell it on the mountain, we've got to go back and be able to reconcile in our hearts the fact that we were sinners and we are saved by grace. Now listen, how would you like to start off the whole Christmas series like I'm doing, bringing in a big old negative like this? Come on, Ty, let's rejoice. Bring the trumpeter back out there if you're going to be like this. He was good. Wasn't he good? That was awesome. In fact, I think that might have been the first trumpet ever at Cowboy Junction in 22 years. That was pretty incredible. 
They had me doing it, but they heard me and they found someone else. <laughs> no, Chris was scheduled. Chris did a great job. But let me say, I know. I know for everybody in the room that you're like, I don't even know about this Jesus. I'm only here today because my mom asked me to come and I can't be here for Christmas. So I just chose the day to go to church with her. I don't know how you got here, but can I turn to you and say, I know how it is when the preacher steps up, steps up and starts talking all of the past and the negatives. And he uses words like sinner and fleshly and fleshly desire. And he talks about the old man. And he talks about who we are. Can't we just get away from that? I want to talk about the rescue, the redemption, the resurrection. I want to talk about how I'm just good with God. And that's the thing that I find so interesting being a pastor in Lee County, New Mexico. How many of my buddies do you think, the old ranchy cowboy guys that, that I've roped with and, 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 and worked cattle with and, and have just been with, who I'm riding next to them, I'm walking next to them, I'm in the truck with them, and I turn to them and I say something like, how's your relationship with the Lord? Knowing full well they don't have a relationship with the Lord. There is nothing in their life that shows fruit. There is nothing in their life that shows life. They only see selfishness and arrogance, and they look like the same old person they've always been their whole life. And I say, how's your relationship with God? Trying to bring up a conversation so that we can talk about this new life that God has for them. And they turn to me, and in all confidence, they say, oh, me and God, we're tight. We're good. Come on, do y'all got those friends too? Do y'all ever go to the oil patch, and you just happen to bring him up? Hey, how's your relationship with God? And the oil patch guy goes, oh, we're blankety-blank good. Like, no, wait, stop, what? No, come on. And we convince ourselves, maybe it's because we're Americans. Maybe it's because we're Americans and we all carry a dollar bill in our pocket that says, in God we trust. And we assume just because we're Americans, we're good, we're good. Maybe, maybe it's a self and a false sense of security. And the false sense of security is, well, I'm not a bad person. I haven't done anything. I'm not, I'm not like that guy. I'm not like that girl. I mean, compared to them, I'm an angel. Me and God, we're tight. We're good. Like, <laughs> I get it. I get it. And if we don't stop and realize, and I hope I set this stage correctly, none of us are good. Not one of us. You can attend church your whole life. You can carry a, and God we trust, dollar bill in your pocket. Heck, you could be a Republican American, or you can be a Democrat American, and it doesn't make a hill of beans in the kingdom of God. We are all sinners lost. And let me just tell you, I know how it is when you hear someone start the gospel off and we are lost and we are broken and the system is broken and we are brokenhearted people. And to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, do you not think us preachers have heard our whole life quit telling us about sin? Quit telling us about sin. And one of my most favorite stories in the Old Testament is a guy named Amos. Amos, if we ever have another kid, he's going to be named Amos. <laughs> and that's a great girl name, too. <laughs> Amos Bean, that was his name. <laughs> Amos is an amazing story, let me just tell you. Because Amos was a prophet and preacher of God. This is Old Testament story. And in the Old Testament, Amos has been going all throughout the communities, telling everyone, you've got to repent. You've got to repent. Bad things are coming. You are not where you're supposed to be. This is not where God wants you to be. Your heart is evil. Your thoughts are evil. Everything about you is evil, and you think you're good, and you're not good. You're evil. You're evil. You're evil. And one day, someone ran Amos down. Let me show you this conversation. In Amos chapter 7, there was a man by the name of Amaziah. And Amaziah had heard Amos preach and preach and preach and preach and start off by trying to get everyone's attention that you have drifted from God's best. Quit fooling yourself. You are an enemy of God. And look what Amaziah says. He confronted Amos and he says, Seer, the guy who prophesies, be on your way. 
Get out of here and go back to Judea where you came from. Hang out there. Do, you, do, do, your, preaching, do your preaching there. But no more preaching at Bethel. Don't show your face around here again. This is the king's chapel. This is a royal shrine. Have you ever felt like this towards someone who just wanted to keep pointing out you're not where God wants you to be? Let me talk to you about being the seer. And I would like to say, do you not think there's other places I'd rather be too? There's some good fishing taking place somewhere. And even if there's only bad fishing, bad fishing is a whole lot better than some of the faces I have to look at when I preach. And Amos felt the same way. Amos was a rancher. Maybe that's why we can relate so much to him here in Lee County. He raised cattle and he had fruit trees. And one day God called him and said, I want you to preach the gospel and I want you to tell them about the evil of their heart and how they are, in, they are an enemy to God. Look at Amos's answer to Amaziah. But Amos stood up to Amaziah, and I think that's so cool. He didn't back down. He stood right up. He stood toe-to-toe -to, -toe to him, and he said these words. I never set up to be a preacher. I never had plans to be a preacher. I raised cattle, and I pruned trees. And I raised cattle, and I pruned trees. And I raised cattle, and I pruned trees. And then God took me off the farm and said, go preach to my people Israel. There's nobody who wants to be the guy that has to point out that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And Amos says, do you not think I'd rather be watching cattle? And do you not think I'd rather be pruning trees? But when God says go, you go. And when God sends someone, it's not because he's mad at you. It's because he loves you. Like a father would turn to a kid and say, come on, I raised you better than this. And it's not a message of despair. It's actually a message to get your attention to then be able to show you the goodness of God. And so I want to just start off, and you may go, where are we going with this? We're going to go somewhere special. But even Amos felt the pressure. And I wanted to show you that we've all got to recognize that if the tension doesn't capture our heart, we'll never be able to recognize the greatest gift and how awesome it was. In fact, if you're real curious how this conversation goes, you think what I'm saying today is bad. You ought to see what Amos tells Amaziah right after this. It is brutal. It's about Amaziah's wife, his family, everything that's going to happen to him, all because Amaziah won't hear the word of the Lord and repent. That's just a fun study later. You'll think I'm, a, you'll think I'm just the coolest little thing in the whole world after you hear what Amos tells Amaziah. So why are we here? The reality is, is that the reason that we can go tell it on the mountain this incredible good news of our Lord is because we recognize just how far away we were from God's best in our lives. If you're in this room and you feel the Lord tugging your heart saying, I'm not here to condemn you and I'm not here to see you stay the same person. I'm not asking you to even like Ty I'm not even asking you to join this church. I'm just trying to get your attention to the misinformation that you have believing, have been believing that you're okay with me. But now the shift. And the shift, it should take place because it's not the negative. It's actually the good news. In Romans chapter 10, verse 14, Paul explains the urgency of the gospel. That Jesus had come to save the people from their tribe and tongue and earth. But they have to receive the offer to be saved. And Paul, in Romans chapter 10, says this. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they ever going to call upon the Lord if they've never believed in him? And how are they going to believe in him who've never heard the story. 
the story of the lost world, but the saving Messiah. And how are they ever going to believe? And how are they ever going to hear if without someone preaching it? And how are they going to preach unless they are sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so the message of the cross and the message of the resurrection that we share with you today is the good news. But for us to really appreciate it, we have to understand just how lost we are. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8, it says this, Now there, we're in the same country, shepherds living in the fields, and they are keeping their watch over the flocks by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were greatly afraid. And in verse 10, it says, And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. The story does not end with our sin. And you don't have a father that lets you stay where you are. But he sends a bridge so that you can choose to know his best for your life. And through his grace, you can be saved Through faith. And it goes on and says, For there is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's pretty cool. And it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth condemnation and trouble for the rest of your life. Does it say that? No. It says, glory to God in the highest. Go tell everyone you know. This is a big deal. And on earth, let there be peace and goodwill towards all men. This peace and goodwill is God's desire for your life. And no longer should we be worried. No longer should we live in fear. No longer should we think that we're an enemy of God if we see that Jesus is the Messiah and humble ourselves to walk away from our wicked ways by accepting him and his blood washing away our sins so that we could be in good standings with our Father. Let me show you this good standing. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and let me say, if you're here and you're like, tell me more about this. How does someone get saved? How does someone follow Jesus? Get your phone out. You may want to take pictures of the screen. These may need to be the scripture memory verses that you memorize this whole week. You could do it. Can you imagine showing up next week and walking up to Pastor Ty and saying, Hey, Pastor Ty, these are the scriptures I've I've memorized. You may be 80 years old and you just may act like a little little kid walking up to your pastor going, Look, at I memorize these scriptures. I will give you a candy cane next year. Oh, next, next week, next week. If you, if you memorize these scriptures, these are the scriptures that can save you today. These are the scriptures that shows us life. First one in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says this, For all have sinned, every one of us, and have come short of the glory of God. What, this is the reality. Every person has sinned in this room. But Romans chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse says, For the wages of sin is death. We all know that. Do we see our lives getting any better without God? Do we see our minds improving without God? Do we find ourselves not thinking evil thoughts without God? And yet everything good only happens by our personal relationship with God our Father through Jesus Christ our Lord and the Holy Spirit renewing us. And this is why we have to realize that all of us start somewhere, but it's the gift of God that is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But not just that one. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says this. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now why would I throw that up there? I throw it up to remind you that even when you were at your worst, Christ would have died for you. That it's not your perfection that brings the gift of God. It is not Jesus who wants you to change first to then be able to be good for him later. He says, come just the way you are. 
And that old chatterbox in your ear right now says, we got to get our life clean. Guys, I, I, I've got too many secrets. I've got too many things people don't know about. You don't realize that it's not people that change you. But it's our Father who already knows everything about you that just wants you to be honest with him and quit running away from him. Quit rebelling, rebelling from his plan for you. And, and he demonstrated his own love for you in that he came to you even before you knew you were a sinner and even before you knew that Christ had died for you. It's kind of like he meets you halfway and he's already standing at the 50-yard line and now he needs you to come to him. This is what it means to accept the greatest gift the world has ever known, that Jesus was sent by God for the forgiveness of the sins of the world so that all men could have life and life more abundantly. If you don't get anything out of today, you, don't get, you can't remember the scriptures, you can't remember the points, you can remember, go tell it on the mountain, but what was the main point? Here's the water cooler moment for today. When you go to work tomorrow and they say, what was church about yesterday? You can say, this is, this is what Ty talked about. This is the water cooler moment. God has built a bridge back to him and his name is Jesus. And we got to go tell everyone we know. One of the first steps of shouting it on the mountain, and it's okay to say, none of us deserved salvation. But he gave it anyway. If you look at the entire Old Testament, God was trying and trying and trying to get our attention. He was trying in this whole part of the Old Testament to get our hearts to turn back to him. And everywhere you look, over and over and over again, very few people ever did. Heck, we looked at Amos and a group of people who didn't turn their hearts. Even Amos being honest with them and saying, don't you realize I would rather be watching cattle and pruning trees, but God's got me preaching to you because he loves you. But look at the stories of Jonah. Jonah's one of my favorite stories. It's a story where Jonah was an awesome preacher, awesome preacher, and people loved him. He would walk into a community and people would celebrate him. Jonah's here. He's about to tell us God's best, God's plan. And people would sit around and listen to Jonah. Jonah got so used to this. Everybody, everywhere I go, people celebrate me, is Jonah's attitude. Until God turned to him and said, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh was the furthest place that Jonah wanted to go to. In fact, the last guy, and this is no joke, Ninevites would skin alive any prophet that ever came and preached in their community. How would you like to go? And God knocks on the door of your heart and says, I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to preach the gospel there. And Jonah did maybe what a lot of us would do. I'm not going to Nineveh. Send me to Artesia, maybe Roswell. <laughs> but I don't want to go to Nineveh. And so he ran from God. When he ran from God, he sat in the belly of the well for three days until he finally said, I'll go. Anything but this and I'll go. And he was terrified. And there was a hundred and something thousand people in the community. And Jonah knew he was going to die and he was angry. And it took him three days to walk across the entire town. And he preached everywhere he go, and the most incredible thing took place. The entire city repented and turned their hearts back to God. It started with the king, and the king brought, Nina, uh, brought, brought Jonah in, and Jonah preached to him, not even thinking this man would do anything. And he took off his kingly robes and put on a sackcloth in representation of the repentance that he was having in his heart because he knew he drifted from God. And from the king, the entire community turned into sorrow as they realized that their lives were lost. And only through repentance and faith in God could they be found. And in that week, the entire community turned their lives back to Christ. It blew, it blew Jonah away that the entire community turned their heart back, back to God. But you know what? That could happen in our community too. And it could happen in your family too. But you know how it happens? It starts with a shouting from the rooftops. You're not an enemy of God anymore. 
And if people turn in and say, what does that even mean? I didn't know, I thought me and God were tired. I thought we, me and God were good. I'm not as bad as that person. I'm not as bad as that person. And when you sit down and you talk to him and you realize, don't you see, we all have darkness in our heart. Every one of us has rebellion in our heart. None of us want to do the right thing. And God has got our attention that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's worth telling everyone about. We're not enemies of God anymore. In fact, let me just sum up everything that we are and everything we can hope in and everything that I think is pretty stinking cool and what I love about this, it could possibly be a run-on sentence, but I'm preaching today, so who cares? You can tell I'm, I, me and English teachers have gone way back over the years. Listen closely. If the good news really means that there is no one too lowly for God to pursue, and if the good news really means that no one so insignificant for God is overlooked, and if the good news means no one is so guilty that God will forsake, and if the good news means no one so broken God cannot heal, no one so lost that God cannot find, that he is able to save to the uttermost, then we've got to go tell everyone. So today we learned a few things, and it's reasons why we should go shout it on the mountain, this incredible gift we've been given. Number one, did you know that you are guilty of sin and an enemy of God? And if you didn't, this is the attention getter. I remember in my own life when a pastor turned to me and said, forever you will at least know and you have been warned. It put chills down my spine. And part of me got me a little angry. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. you just don't warn somebody. I mean, who are you to warn anybody? I mean, you mean to warn you? I'll warn you. And this was my flesh fighting against truth. And the truth was there to really set me free. Can I turn to you and say this desire that God does not see anyone lost? And the only reason you would stay lost is if you don't remember the next thing I'm about to show you. This part here is just to get your attention, like it got my attention. And then the pastor that told me this, told me this. Do you know that God sent his son so you could reconcile with God and have an abundant life? And it's amazing how sweet sugar is when there's been that sour on your tongue. It's amazing how sweet balm is, medicine is, when you've suffered so long. It's amazing how sweet kind words are when the harsh reality of the words before cut deep in your heart. And these words mean so much more Will you understand where we started and in spite of our sin, salvation is here for us to all come home. That God sent his son so that you could reconcile with God, a repentance, a turnaround, a grace area, to be able to turn around and come back to God and his abundant life that he has for you. But here's my last and final thing. A little warning. We all come with a timestamp. This is a limited time offer. It wouldn't be Christmas without a limited time offer, right? All reality is, you're not gonna live forever. And just driving home today you never know what the next second's going to take, do, or be in your life. And today, this story is worth shouting from the rooftops. It's worth seeing that there is a bigger picture than even what we thought it was. But if we all start at the main place, we are all lost, then we can celebrate the fact God sent his only son that whosoever believeth in him 
shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me ask you the question I couldn't wait to ask you today. Are you in this room? And as we were talking today, it was like the Holy Spirit was just tugging your heart. And he was saying, are you tired of fooling yourself? Are you tired of running from the truth? Are you ready to pull back the curtains in your life and let the light in? Are you ready to rip the roof off and finally let there be no dark places in any crack, crevice, closet in your life? And for in this moment to be honest before God and say, God, I am a sinner. I am not a good person. I have wrecked most of the things I touch. And God, I have never, ever, ever said forgive me but I can tell you what can happen if you do right here in this very place all a heaven opens up and God leans in to hear your prayer of honesty and heaven will rejoice in the most powerful prayer you've ever prayed in your life an honest prayer finally being honest in your life this will trickle to other areas of your life to where God will begin to massage your heart on the person that he's called you to be. But it's got to start somewhere. And it can't start with man or people or even church. This has nothing to do with church. This is between you and him. And I am just the dude with the food preaching today, the good news. But if you don't respond, it's just another day. And if you're in this room, let me just ask you, and you know the gift of Jesus and how awesome it is, and you once repented and now you are saved by grace, would you give me a a great big oh yeah. yeah and so in this room you're not surrounded by people who are perfect you are surrounded by people who are imperfect but every day have a perfect Lord working in them and what it means to be a son or a daughter of the most high God and we celebrate not because we earned our salvation we celebrate today because we heard this message once in our life and it changed us forever that we are all lost but it is the gift of God through Jesus Christ that rescues us and we should go tell it on the mountain